If I were to sum up my experience at Tesla, here's what I'd say. First, the hours are long. It's not like anyone tells you to work extra hours, but it's just sort of expected. So working 9 to 7 is normal, and it's not surprising to see people working there until 8 or 9 p.m. That being said, you learn so much in such a short period of time. Every project I ever got, my first reaction was like, what, you expect me to do that? But eventually I'd figure it out, which is what pushed me to learn so much in such a small amount of time. So it's not a chill job, and it's definitely a little stressful. Not as stressful as exam season in university though. However, you can burn out if you're not careful because when you're not at work, you're usually like thinking about all your work projects. But everyone there really loves Tesla. Some people may be a bit cocky, but for the most part, everyone is super chill and very helpful. However, it is hard to get a hold of people since everyone is always in meetings. Personally, I was in like two or three meetings a day at least. That being said, the pay at Tesla isn't as high as other tech companies in California. I worked at Tesla as a mechanical design engineer on their interiors vehicles design engineer team in 2021. As the name suggests, I worked on the mechanical design of the parts inside of the car. That includes things like the speaker panel, decor, center console, instrument panel, vents, glove box, etc. Now what exactly does a mechanical design engineer do to create these parts? To answer that, let me explain the mechanical design engineering process that we use at work. This is a process that isn't just specific to Tesla as many mechanical engineers at all companies tend to do this. Whether you work at Apple, Uber, Lyft, Lucid or a small tech startup, you will have to go through this process in order to build something. So I'm not really exposing anything since every mechanical engineer does this process and should have a good understanding of it. Anyways, every company has a design studio team or UX team that's in charge of how our product will look like on the outside. In the automotive design space, we call that the A surface. Depending on how sophisticated your design studio team is, they can create clay models of what the A surface will look like, or they can create virtual mockups using 3D software like Blender or SketchUp that will kind of give you an idea of what the outside surface looks like. At this point in the process, what the design studio team created looks really pretty and aesthetic, but it's not functional. So that's where design engineers come in. We take their pretty designs and make them work. We identify what materials we want the product to be made out of, what manufacturing process we want to use, how all the different parts will attach to one another, as well as how all the parts will move relative to one another. We spend a lot of time working with the B surface, which is basically everything that goes on behind the A surface and is usually not visible to a customer. For example, this would be the A surface since it's visible to the driver and passengers, and this would be the B surface since it's the behind the scenes. To create functional designs, we use CAD software to be able to do this. The most common CAD software is SOLIDWORKS, CATIA, NX, Inventor, or Fusion 360. We create 3D models and 2D engineering drawings using these software. As we create our drawings, we're usually working back and forth to the design team. That way, we both make sure that we end up with something that we both think is good. There's usually a lot of meetings that go on between designers and engineers until we finally reach a compromise. There's even this stigma sometimes in engineering offices because engineers are like on one end of the spectrum where they really just care about the functionality of a product and designers are on the other end of the spectrum where their priority is making it look as pretty and as nice as possible. Anyways, once we're done with these drawings, we'll then send them to external vendors who will be in charge of building them for us. Sometimes before doing that, if we have 3D printers or laser cutters at work, we use those to create a small prototype just to make sure that our design actually works before sending it out to be professionally built. At the same time, as mechanical engineers, we usually don't work alone and we interface a lot with other types of engineers. For example, if I'm working on the mechanical design of speakers, then I need to work a lot with the audio engineers. Or if I'm working on the ventilation system of a car, then I need to work closely with the thermal steam. Two of our biggest priorities as mechanical design engineers is DFM and DFA. DFM stands for design for manufacturing, which means we need to have our parts be easy to build. To do this, we need to have a really good understanding of the most common manufacturing processes out there like injection molding, CNC machining, casting, sheet metal forming, etc. Some common rules of thumb we include in our design to make them easy to build is to avoid sharp corners, deep holes, and thin walls. That way these parts don't get distorted when they're being built. DFA stands for Design for Assembly. So once you've designed a product, which in engineering we usually refer to it as an assembly, this assembly is made up of several parts. And now how all these parts will come together needs to be easy and straightforward. Some rules of thumb we try to implement to have a good DFA experience is to reduce the number of parts we're using or to add self-locating features. For example, if I want to place the spring in this hole, this design has bad DFA since it's not easy to put together because the spring will hit these corners. So we need to change our design a little bit so that it looks like this. Now the spring can slide through to get to where it needs to be. I was in charge of designing several parts on the car, so I had quite a bit of ownership and had quite a bit of impact at work. When I first learned about my projects and what components or parts I'm expected to design, my first reaction was like, wait, what, you're expecting me to do that? 
Obviously, I didn't actually tell him that, I just thought it. It took me a while to get used to that type of responsibility and ownership, but eventually I got used to it and I was able to learn a lot in a short period of time. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to film in the office, but to give you an idea, it's just a straight building with engineering desks on the left and right side of the hallway in an open desk environment. Whenever you have to walk across the office, it's always a cool feeling to see what other engineers are working on because you can take a quick peek at their work and it's really cool to see what everyone else is doing. It's kind of crazy that we can just take a concept car idea and turn it into an actual working vehicle design. Also, one of the coolest things is that the Fremont Tesla factory is like right down the street of our engineering offices. We usually try to go there as often as we can just to see how these cars are being built and if the designs are going according to plan. It's definitely a really satisfying feeling to see the parts that you design actually go in the car and that car getting delivered to customers. Although whenever I meet someone that knows I worked at Tesla, the first thing they ask me is did you meet Elon Musk? I wish, but unfortunately no. However, he does come down to the office every once in a while to review new cars, work on some quality issues, or for some vehicle launch events. That being said, let's look at what the daily schedule looks like. I would usually wake up around 8 or 8.30 a.m., take a shower, have some breakfast, then drive about 20 minutes to work. At the time, I lived in Cupertino and I worked in person five days a week from the office in Fremont, California. I would usually get to the office around 9 or 9.30 a.m. Once I'm there, I do some of the mechanical engineering work I mentioned earlier, work on projects and emails or attend meetings. The office also had a little cafeteria that had a lot of cereal, so I'd be snacking on that during work. I'd then leave the office around 6.30 or 7 or sometimes even 7.30 p.m. and I'd be at home in about 20 minutes. After I get home, I'll usually make myself some dinner and depending on the day, I'd either hit the gym or go to jiu-jitsu. Earlier, I talked about the mechanical design engineering process, but how do we actually use that to build cars? Remember how I told you that car companies tend to have design studio teams that basically design the A surface of the car or the outer shell surface of the car since us engineers can't draw? They send us digital surface models of the car and we work on bringing that model to life in a few steps. First, we need to break down the car into its components. Second, we need to figure out what engineering requirement each component will have. That can include things like aesthetically pleasing, lightweight, waterproof, heat resistant, strong, low cost, securely mounted, aerodynamic, complies with laws and regulations, etc. Every requirement must be met, but sometimes achieving one requirement can mean you're sacrificing or compromising on another requirement, which is how things can get a little messy when you're designing things in engineering. Hypothetically speaking, let me share with you a simple project example. Let's say we're working on designing this component for one of the new cars. The design studio would then give us information through surface models on what that should look like on the outside. Then we would all work together to generate some engineering requirements for that part. For instance, some of the requirements were that the gap around the part must be small enough so that it doesn't look ugly. Second, it also can't be taken off too easily. Third, it needed to hold other components and easily attach to its surroundings. Fourth, it also just needs to look good overall. And five, there was also some mass and cost requirements. With these requirements, it can be overwhelming, but the thing to remember with these physical products is that they can never be perfect. That's because whenever we're manufacturing physical products, they can be a little bigger, a little smaller, or they may be a little bit out of place. So as a design engineer working on this project, we have to answer questions like, how do I mount this part? Do I use tape, magnets, screws, clips? If I use clips, how many do I need and where should I place them so the part can be securely mounted? What material do I use to get this nice wooden finish? Should I make the entire part out of wood or use a mix of materials? Should I use actual wood or a wood veneer? The final design also can't take too long to install because if it does, it's going to slow down the car production speed which can cost us a lot. Ideally, our job is to find one solution that can satisfy all these requirements. But once we finalize our design, we still have to go through a series of steps to verify it. These steps include prototyping, FEA simulations, root cause analysis, testing and reliability, sourcing, and production. Prototyping refers to creating a tangible concept of the design. FEA simulations refers to simulating the real world in a CAD software. Root cause analysis basically means we identify problems that could happen or have happened and come up with solutions for them. Testing reliability means that we make sure the design actually does what we want it to do. Sourcing is the process of finding suppliers that will get us the parts we need. And production is the process of actually making the part. There's way more that actually goes on behind these six steps. For example, how do we test a part that's supposed to be on a car for 20 years in only two months? Or once the car is in its production stage, how can we make sure that when we're making 2 million parts that they all come out exactly the same? But anyways, I hope this video gave you a better idea about working at Tesla as an engineer is like. If you want to see the resume that got me the job, check out this video. Or if you want to see what engineering interviews are like, check out that video. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Peace!